School Committee. Um, and just so the people know, the people on this capital subcommittee are uh, Rebecca Stone and Barbara Scotto and David Pollack. The rest of the school committee has decided to join us tonight. So, uh, but the, the actual subcommittee is the four of us. Um, I'd like to frame tonight's discussion as a means to an end. Uh, as most of you know only too well, we have a short-term problem of overcrowding in our elementary schools. We need temporary solutions in order to get to the end, that end being newly renovated K through 8 buildings, which will be able to accommodate all our students. Dr. Lupini tonight will lay out for you our dilemmas, which prevent us from having a final resolution for you to comment on tonight. I know that this will increase people's anxiety about where will my children be in 2015. Uncertainty is difficult for everyone, including for all of us, too, here who are trying to deal with it. Our problem is that we don't want to propose one solution and then five months later propose another solution. Uh, this is probably more difficult for children to, to have one solution and then have to be told, no, that's not what's going to happen, than waiting and, until we come up with the appropriate solution which solves our problem. Within this solution, everybody should be aware, our primary goal is to always provide an excellent Brookline education wherever a child may be receiving it. So our agenda tonight will be a presentation from the superintendent regarding the current recommendations for elementary space use of the old Lincoln School. Then school committee members will have time to ask questions and make comments. And then we'll entertain comments and questions from the audience. Um, you should all be aware it's being recorded. That's why we have the microphones. And so therefore, if, when you do come up to speak, to please speak into the microphone. Um, and it would be helpful uh, if people can, as, as they determine whether they want to speak or not, please, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. And we'll go down the sign-up sheet and then ask if anybody else has any other comments or questions. So with that, I'll ask Dr. Lupini to begin, please. Thank you, Ms. Charlovsky. You're welcome. Um, as, as you've said, um, I, off of our long-term um, space plan, which the school committee adopted in September of 2013, um, the administration was charged with uh, creating a set of short-term elementary space recommendations um, designed to create capacity within the system and ensure that students are provided with a quality education and school experience while the needed renovations and additions take place. Um, we had put forward a plan a number of months back, um, which we'd uh, like to um, amend slightly, uh, put a hold on in part, um, b because of some information that we believe could come out of the devotion um, building committee work. Um, this is not meant in any way to, uh, to, to try to um, advocate for any particular option in that discussion. But it is, as you said earlier, it is meant to make sure that when we put forward a plan, it is actually the appropriate plan to address the building option that will take place at the Devotion School. So just in rough, let me, let me give a sense of, of that just for a moment. And then I'll go through what we're recommending and what we're asking you to hold on and then be happy to answer your questions. Um, so uh, we have a meeting of the Devotion Building Committee tomorrow. And um, one of our uh, initial tasks here in the next, I believe, few weeks, I believe it's by March 17th, if I'm correct, um, is to identify um, three potential options, three preferred options. Three to four. Three to four, thank you. Um, and, um, and the architect's done some great work on giving us a number of options to look like that fit into a set of families um, around what might happen at the, at the school. And one of those families um, consists of options that would build a new devotion school. Um, under that family of options, uh, some of what we've, we've orig we originally recommended would not be necessary. Um, I want to be clear. We do not have space at the Devotion School for students beginning in the 15-16 school year. So some part of that student population we will need to move and utilize the old Lincoln School for in that year. It, regardless, of regard, regardless of which option is chosen. 
Um, however, it may not need to be 7th and 8th grade and then 6th, 7th and 8th grade depending on the, on the particular option that's chosen for the project. So um, we'll have this discussion tomorrow. We'll work with the architects and we will uh, create three preferred options. Um, in September, I believe it actually has to be completed in August. Is that right, Jen? In August um, and submitted for an MSBA meeting on September 24th, we have to designate the preferred option, the preferred option. So by September, at worst, we, we would have some answers to some very important questions about the devotion population and what steps we would need to take there. And that will give us time to investigate other options having to do with other schools um, that are either, were either in the options that we laid out originally or are certainly schools that may be or are going to be at capacity by 2015. Okay? So, so that's the reasoning behind what we've done. What's still on the table for you, though, um, that we brought, brought forward when we brought you five original um, recommendations was to designate, the old, is to designate the old Lincoln School as a transition elementary school for 15, 16 through 17, 18, those three years. To designate it in some configuration to include grades 6, 7, and or 8 during that time period. Um, we laid out a series of reasons for that recommendation uh, having to do with a number of elements including the fact that we were going to be using it as a high school swing space beyond that time period and if we chose certain other grade levels it would require more extensive renovation to the school and then renovation back um, had to do with whether the school was actually appropriate for primary age students all of those kinds of things led us to the recommendation of this particular grade configuration um, and the third piece that we talked about that day was to direct the administration to formulate our specific proposals for what the old Lincoln School would be used for um, when we used it for um, another building on the campus of Brookline High School. I will repeat, because we have an audience tonight, that it will not be a ninth grade campus. It simply doesn't work as a ninth grade campus. In the year that that actually happens, there are too many ninth graders for it to be a ninth grade campus. So it would not be a campus for one particular grade level. We are going to have to figure out what within programs um, or other concepts that exist at the high school, what would best fit um, for, it, for its use. So that, those three recommendations are still on the table. Um, what you adopted in, in January um, was uh, to allow us to hire uh, a principal for the school uh, it'd be on or before Jan uh, April of 2014 and we did. We've hired Monica Crowley who currently serves as the vice principal of the Lawrence School who's been named to the position and has already started to do some of the work with the architects and, and our building department around the configuration that's going to take place at this building. I've laid out in the letter that there's plenty for Monica to do in the, what was designated as this planning year um, she has a very busy time ahead of her, no matter which schools and which particular grade levels out of the configuration of 6, 7, 8 end up at the school. Um, so what we're recommending be postponed pending the availability of additional information is the specifics of that recommendation around devotion. That is, that in 2015, 2016, um, we were recommending that we move the devotion 7th and 8th grade students to the school and for the other two years, 16, 17 and 17, 18, that we move 6th, 7th and 8th grade. We need more information from the building commission's decisions and recommendations and work on to the, to the uh, Massachusetts School Building Authority before we can make that particular recommendation. And then that obviously tables all of our other options, right? because um, we, we will continue to investigate these. We laid out at that time that we could pair up that devotion population with the Driscoll school population, with the Lawrence school population. Again, all depending on a series of questions that we had that we laid out in the original recommendation. That it could have been Pierce or it could, have, could be a, this multi-school plan which involves um, some configuration of those grade levels from multiple elementary schools meaning more than just Pierce or Lawrence or Driscoll, um, depending on the needs of that particular school. And, and uh, as you know, um, and we will discuss more fully with you at an upcoming capital meeting, we have uh, any number of schools that are at capacity or that reach capacity by 2015. So we have lots of candidates for 
particular populations um, that we could utilize in, in a school, say, if we were to be able to designate it because of choices made at devotion, if we were able to be de designated in some other way. And so what are, what, are, what are the key issues for us over the next few weeks and months? Because, you know, September is sort of the end date. There could be an option, option or options chosen at devotion that lead us to be able to come back to you with recommendations sooner. But the preferred option for the devotion school will be an important part of this, this set of recommendations. Um, the Driscoll School project, um, the, the statement of interest, the work that will be done to, to put that project into the, into the queue will be an important part of this consideration. The classroom addition that was originally specified at Lawrence School, um, which as you know, um, the, the, the modulars um, did not come in on, on budget. We've since dropped back and are in conversations with the town around whether there are other ways to continue on with that project. That would play an important part because this is another school that's at capacity now. And then overcrowding issues as we encounter them over the next few years at Pierce and Baker and Lincoln beyond that will factor into what we may need to use in terms of the, grade config the specific grade configurations for old Lincoln. So um, clearly the preferred option of devotion is the, is the sort of the linchpin in this decision but it gives us lots of time to play out some of these other options as well. So a modified set of recommendations in order to give the Devotion Building Committee more time to do their work, but a set of recommendations around the, the, um, the grade configuration use of the building um, that are still on the table. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll entertain questions now from the school committee. Um, yes, go ahead. Um, thanks, um, Madam Chairman. Um, uh, Dr. Lupini, I just want to clarify two things. One is um, I think it's really important since, since I am completely agnostic, not being on the de Devotion Building Committee um, and having only seen very briefly the, the, fam the different families of options that you described, um, I assume that, that our official position is that we are agnostic on the decision that the Devotion Building Committee comes to, that it is, it is operating completely without constraints, that there's, there is no advocacy from you or from us about any of those particular options. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Thank you. That was certainly my position, and I assumed it was the committee's position. Um, That's right. Just my, my, so just to be clear, because I sit on that committee as well, so... <laughs> Right? Um, my, well, there, you know, are, you a, are you a voting member? I am. Yes. Okay. I am. So, um, you know, I, I, think, I think one of our key considerations in that, in that particular discussion is, is program. I mean, we had a conversation, as, as you alluded to, at the school committee last week that was largely driven around program and designing the building to be able to implement the program that we believe is necessary to make a large space feel smaller to, to create grade, um, grade spans within the building. And, and as you saw last week, certain configurations um, lend themselves uh, uh, more neatly to, to being able to do that and to create that kind of program. And certain of those families lend themselves in, in that way. And, and of course, on top of that, there are other considerations. So um, yes, in terms of this set of recommendations, um, we're not advocating here for, for any, any of those options. We're simply trying to make sure that when we implement a short-term set of recommendations, um, they take as many factors as we can have available to us at a particular moment in time into account. Okay. So the other thing I just wanted to be clear on, when you say we're postponing the decision on the makeup of Old Lincoln School, the transition school, um, you're not postponing the discussions that you've been in about what the needs are of the other things. We're not just, we're not stopping right now just because devotion is in question, right? No, and as I said, even, even as recently as yesterday in a discussion with town officials about, about Lawrence and what we might be able to do there, while those discussions are about the potential for those four classrooms and whether we could make that stick construction or whether we want to go back out with modulars, all of that leads into, into this. All of that becomes part of this. So no, we're not stopping consideration of any of these options at all. Okay. So, and in terms of the timing of when we might be asked to take a vote on an actual recommendation of the full configuration for the school, are we looking at, um, at September before we actually are able to take a, uh, be asked to take a vote on that? So or I, th I think September is the latest. Okay. Again, again, 
um, depending on options that are on the table, depending on families of options that are on the table, um, depending on what happens between the three preferred options being designated and the one chosen, there may be factors in there that, 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 that lead us to be able to come back with the recommendation at that time. So I would say the answer to your question is at worst by September 24th. Okay. I'm just a little bit concerned because this is going to involve so many different schools right. um, in the discussions that, that those discussions not be in their final stages over the summer months when right. the community is dispersed. Well, and, certainly uh, if, we get, if we get past a per certain time in this school year, we would, of course, even if we had all the information that we thought we needed around the, the devotion option, for example, we would certainly wait and take up those conversations in the initial weeks of September so that we weren't having them over the summer, in other words. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, thank you. Mr. Morris. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Dr. Lupini, just uh, uh, a thought uh, in case the question uh, is out in the audience. Is there any possibility that we'll have any relief in this year's, this coming year's si kindergarten size? Do we have any indication as to what that uh, kindergarten class is likely to be? Is it uh, likely to be a lot lower, which would give us some relief or, or not? Um, so all we have is our first marker, um, which, I'm sorry, is, for, is, is, is what is the number that we have after our initial registration at each of the schools. Um, we've developed a pretty, we think, pretty sophisticated view of that that allows us to, to make predictions as we go along. Um, that marker, as I reported to the school committee last week, is, a, is approximately 10 students larger than last year's class which was a class of 630. 630 is our number that, that we've used from now through 2020 in all of our estimates. And we feel pretty comfortable with that number of 630 right now. I certainly, if, I was, if, you, if you wanted me to do something with it, it certainly wouldn't be lowering it. Does that answer your question? Yes, it certainly does. And I thought that might be of interest to everyone. Thank you. Yes, Dave, uh, Mr. Pollack. These three recommendations mm -hmm. here are uh, the policies that are being, um, that, that are kind of on the table. Mm -hmm. When, and this may be a question for Helen or Alan or, or all of you, when do you anticipate asking the uh, Capital Subcommittee and the School Committee to vote on these recommendations? Well, because, because we're, pro go ahead. Haven't we? No, we haven't. I'm no. sorry. Go ahead. Um, all of our conversations with the architect on board um, have, been around, have been around this grade configuration. So um, I, I would think it would be um, better sooner than later um, on that to make sure that, that the work that we're doing with them is actually part of what the school committee has adopted. So, so is, it, is it fair to, to say to the audience that, that, the, that the, we as the capital subcommittee are particularly interested in anything that you would like to comment in relation to these specific recommendations? Because it is these specific recommendations that we're going to be voting on shortly. Uh, and we, of course, want to hear anything else you'd like to tell us. Well, I think, if I may, um, what seems to me, and I've heard this question, well, how can you build, you know, the the old or renovate the old Lincoln School without knowing who's going in there. I think it's pretty clear that our program in six, seven, and eight, it, any configuration of those grades can work with with a building that we would design. There may be subtle differences in terms of what we might do with a third science lab or those kinds of things, but that's the extent of of the differences. Right. So so I think that that's an important piece to. To consider, and, and maybe you're right, it would be a good idea to at least affirm these recommendations because we know that that's, these three things will happen. We just don't know who or which grade levels will be in there, and that's, that's the second piece. Yes? So just following up on, on your comment about maybe a third science lab or, mm -hmm. or something, can, can you just speak to the question of, well, it's very important that the uh, building be ready for September of 2015 mm -hmm. to take, to open up as a new school with a full load of 
uh, of students, mm -hmm. full building. And we've hired an architect to do that. Yes. Can you just speak to the chal challenges, if any, of the, of the architect and the school of be moving towards readiness with the uncertainty that's on the table yeah. here? Yeah, I'm going to ask Mr. Rowe to, to speak to that. Oh, there may be one. Yeah, okay. That okay. one's working. Your, your question is essentially, do we think the building will be ready? Because the answer is oh, it's, yes. It's yes. No, my question is, now that we're stepping back from a clear uh, designation of what configuration of six, seven, and eight, and from where the students will be drawn, to a uh, a, a slightly uh, vaguer recommendation of some configuration within the six, seven, and eight frame, is there anything that that causes does in, that in any way cause you and the architects and the building department more uh, any new ch any extra challenges or can you just get the building ready just like you could you you're you're fine with that we yes we believe we can get it ready in fact monica crowley and i met with the architects this afternoon to have that kind of a conversation it was really to try to vet out what's the program going to look like and we talked about things as, as dr lupini said what the science classrooms would look like whether we'd have an art room what the what the makeup of an art room would be whether we needed a music room, whether we needed a computer lab, the fact that we wanted to have configuration so that we could have a, a front of every classroom where there'd be a drop that we could set up with smart board if necessary. And there's all those kinds of requirements. The fact that we want to renovate all the bathrooms. They'll come back to us with their price list of, okay, here's, here's what it's going to cost you to do these things, as well as other upgrades that we, we may want to do in the building. Uh, for instance, this is a building that has a full... Um, gymnasium, a full auditorium. She would like to use it with a full auditorium, not something that Runkle chose to do. They put right. the library there. She would like to have a library. The question of how to configure those, so that we're working through those kinds of conversations, but those are essentially generic. An English classroom, a social studies classroom, a world language classroom looks the same, whether you're sixth grade or 11th grade, and part of this conversation is, once we're through using the building for this transition, we would hope that we could find a way that it will help us with the, with the high school enrollment bulge that we're going to face, too, at least as we go through some of the transitions. So, that, so that's what we're working toward. As you may recall, we've used this building over the last 20 years for five schools, plus two schools we rented it out to, um, and we've never had $3.5 million to work with. Charlie Simmons, the director of town buildings, has worked on a, on a real short budget every time to, well, we'll paint this, we'll, we'll do this wall, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll retile the hallway on this floor, we'll put some carpet in here, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, we'll reconfigure. So that we, we really have an opportunity um, to do some significant work. So, you know, we really believe we're going to have a, a good quality space for education for this age group. And um, what, I, what the architects from Arrow Street have said is um, they would expect to finish their feasibility, their, their technical review, uh, and so that we could have, you know, come to an agreement on what we'll spend the money on. Uh, they would not expect construction to begin before September. They're looking at nine months or so of work, and they believe that's more than enough, and we actually believe that's more than enough to get the work done so that we'll be ready to essentially turn it over to Monica in early August of, of uh, you know, 15, so she could be ready. So that's a long answer to your question. So, Thank you, Mr. Right. Which is, yes, we'll be ready. I want to take one minute to, for those of you who don't know her, Monica Crowley happens to be here with us, and if you don't mind, maybe you could stand up just so that people could, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, she didn't know I was going to do that to her, but I just felt like she's here and you know, people should at least put a face with the name. Um, Ms. Scott. I have a question about the third recommendation. Um, I'm somewhat concerned about the date of January 2015. We are already in March of 2014, and I wonder if that is a realistic time frame. I know we need to move fast, but we're talking about specific proposals, and I'm wondering if, given everything else that's on the table, if we really can manage to get specific proposals in that by January 2015. So um, we may not be able to. Um, and we may need to come back to you for some sort of an extension on that. I'd prefer to leave it because we are looking at these uh, bids around the 
the work that the headmaster and, and I are are doing and the consultant work that we're going to have help us with that. That will that could help us with some of this. It's possible that we may not have specific proposals, but we may have some ideas to come back to you by then. So if you're willing to be a little loose with that recommendation and date, then uh, I, I think we can leave it leave it as is. That's certainly our goal um, to have that done. We, we know what the size of the school will be. We, we know what those numbers look like by those years. And we should be able to at least have some, um, some pretty good ideas by then. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Ditka. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is more of a, a comment than a question. I just I want to say that um, this is sort of a new way to do things um, for us, which is to try to um, maybe not new, new, but um, different a little bit. To to try to be more um, transparent in all of the steps of the sausage making process um, than perhaps we um, had been in the past. I mean, obviously, all of our meetings are public meetings, um, but I think that the, the trade-off, what I appreciate about this is that we, uh, you know, a number of weeks ago we thought something might be the answer, but instead of just going forward with that, given that there's new information on the table, we actually decided to collectively make sure that given all the information we have at any point in time, that we are optimizing our decisions. And so I recognize that that means that when new information comes in, you know, some windows are closed, but some windows are still open. And so I guess what, what I appreciate about that is the, is that, um, that flexibility, but it also strikes me that, you know, when it, it's very hard, I think, for everyone to keep up with something like that, because if you see plans that aren't fully baked, then they aren't fully baked and they look less formed. And so I think there's this trade-off that we're trying to navigate as a committee and that the community is trying to navigate between being completely buttoned up and saying this is exactly the plan and exactly how it's going to roll out versus being more adaptive and flexible and making sure that in any given point in time as new information comes in, we're always optimizing and re-optimizing the decision set that we're, that we're facing. So I appreciate this. I, I recognize it's hard. It's a challenge for a public group to do this. It's a challenge for the public to do this. So I would just say thank you. We're kind of all on this journey together and I'm, I'm glad that we are not barreling forward with a set of recommendations that we don't need to make because as David pointed out, if it, if, if it really doesn't materially impact, for example, the architects and what they're doing, they're going to do the same thing anyway. It, we don't need this particular piece of it. I mean, we needed to hire a principal because the principal had to do a whole bunch of stuff. That one wasn't negotiable, but some of these things are negotiable. So I just appreciate the, the thoughtfulness about which decisions absolutely have to get made by when because they're a critical path for other things and which ones we can kind of take a step back on and say, all right, new information is coming in. How do we, how do we re-optimize? So thank you, Helen. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everyone, for doing that. Can I, can I, can I just say that? It's not comfortable to do it that way, I have to say. And, and we, actually, um, we, we actually, this is the second time we've done this in this particular process. And I just want to point out um, so that we, we go back, we can really go back to the beginning. This, this was not actually the original recommendation. Right, right. The original recommendation was okay. devotion 6th, 7th, and 8th graders for 15, 16 through 17, 18. And off of the f feedback that we had uh, at parent forums, we, we went back and looked really hard at, at what we were proposing and uh, particularly around special education programs because those are grade span kinds of programs and, and in particular um, uh, Jen Fluelling and Mark Nacht, our special education administrator um, who, who has Devotion School as one of his schools, um, went back and looked student by student over the three year period and, and, and believe, then, then let me know that they believed that we could actually um, limit the move in the first year, which was enrollment driven, not construction driven, to just the two grade levels. And so we were able to make that adjustment. And you're right, thank you for the <laughs> kind words, but, it, but, it, but it's, not, it's not comfortable to set recommendations out and then sort of ask for this input, but it, but, it, but it does accomplish what I think people ask us to do, which is to be transparent about these and to sort of ask for input and make adjustments as we go. The part that comes with that is, you're right, sometimes we're putting out recommendations that are not completely baked. No, but and then it's I think it's a good example of taking input. I mean, we get all kinds of input from all kinds of people, but when it can actually help solve a problem, I think that the sixth grade at Devotion was a really good example of input that we got that, you know, said, oh, right, okay, this can actually help solve a problem. It wasn't just noise, I would say. So, 
So, uh, Mr. Pollock and then Ms. Cox. Um, but we, we, the town is Mr. Rowe and the building department uh, and, the, uh, and the building commission are proceeding on the basis of an assumption of the middle of these three oh, yes. recommendations. We are moving ahead. Yes, we are. Yes, exactly. Yes. With those great configurations. So I, I don't think we want to be, I think we want to vote on that when, when we next convene. We would have very different looking bathrooms where we'd have chosen a different. Right. So, I, I mean, we're all, this is manifest. This is what we, we all believe we're doing. But to, and, and I was a little surprised that we hadn't voted on it because I just didn't remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we want to hear from the public on this. And then at our next meeting, I think we should vote certainly on the middle of those three. But there's no change, there's no possibility of changing these. We just haven't adopted them yet. Okay. We did, but okay. Ms. Cox. Um, so like Ms. Tarlovsky and Ms. Ditkoff, I just want to recognize that this has, this can be unsettling. It's unsettling for us. It's unsettling for you. I, I intimately know how unsettling it is as someone who has a student who's going to be somehow involved in this. Um, and that what I hope we'll all focus on is that the ultimate goal is to create a really great school at the old Lincoln School. Um, maybe a place where we will all be hoping to send our children. Um, and that's, that's really the, the end game of this whole process. And just, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, I just had one, um, one more question and clarification off of what Ms. Scotto was asking about. The, um, the recommendation for the use of Old Lincoln by Brookline High School is a recommendation for temporary use. You're not suggesting yes. that it's... We, we are not. No, I, that, that, is, that is temporary use. We've laid out that that's at least a two-year. Uh, I, I don't know the exact okay. number of years yet, um, but we're talking about the, the, you're right, the temporary use. Temporary use, use while, while Brookline High School is... Something. Something is... is uh, it's something, yes. Yes, is addressed. Okay, thank you. So I, I'd just like to follow up on Ms. Cox's um, remarks. Uh, I remember, and um, Piper Smith Mumford is here, I remember when my daughter was in the first ninth grade class that went to the high school. And, uh, you know, we all worried at the time, how is that going to be? How are they going to manage? Is it going to work? There were many parents who were very, <laughs> very concerned about it. and and. In the end, it was probably the best class that came through, or the two years that were there, were the best classes at the high school because they were such a together class, and, and the experience was a great experience. So, you know, I think we have experience in making, uh, making tra changes and transitions work well. And, and I think that's, that's an important thing, and we have some of the same people still here <laughs> helping out on that. So. Um, I guess at this point, unless there's another question or comment from the school committee, um, I'd like to... I, you want that sheet? Yeah, if you don't mind. I think there's a sheet back there if uh, people have signed up. Don't worry if you haven't. Um, we could... Is there, another, is there two sheets or just one? Maybe if there's an um, empty one. Well, there's one, but I can leave the other one. Yeah, and in case anybody else didn't get a chance to any? sign up. Great. Um, I think what I'll do is just start at the top of the list and uh, work our way down. And um, as since I, why don't we start with uh, Mr. Shallot, Andrew Shallot, or Shalit? Shallot. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I have it here, but if you wouldn't mind just saying where you live and sure. Uh, yeah. No, that's that would that's be great. a key point where I live. Um, my name is Andrew Shallot. I'm a parent at Pierce and also a beat parent. I have the, the pleasure of living at 14 Griggs Terrace, which is exactly 0 0.6 miles walking distance to Pierce, Devotion, and Driscoll schools. <laughs> so Equidistance. I could end up at any of these schools um, long term. Um, over the last, but tonight I am speaking as a, as a Pierce parent specifically, but hopefully for for, uh, more broadly than that. Over the last month, as some of these options have come up, there's been a lot of uh, concern among Pierce uh, parents and, and other people at Pierce about the possible impact on our community. And we've had a, a number of discussions. And part of what's come out of that is this document that, um, that I'm sharing with you. This isn't official in any way, but it does reflect the sense of some parents. And it's timely, in, I think, in that it's 
there's not a specific proposal on the table, and this document isn't a response to a specific proposal. It's a set of principles that we hope you'll consider as you put together the ultimate plan for this transition period. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just run through them quickly. One is um, to preserve the K-8 model for as many students as possible. I've heard from a lot of parents um, who aren't happy with the proposed use of Old Lincoln that it may be temporary, but for the kids who are there, it's the only sixth, seventh, or eighth grade that they'll have. And we should preserve the K-8 model for as many students as possible just because there are 550 seats at Old Lincoln. Um, you don't have to fill all 550 of them. Um, the, uh, the next is avoid breaking up communities when possible. Pierce is pretty crowded, and um, we'd still like to stay together if we can find the space to stay together. There might be an assumption that, oh, everyone at Pierce would be better off if we could take a couple hundred kids out and give people some breathing room. And we really would like to try to stay together if we can find the space, whether it's the Sperber Center or other, um, other space options. And we're, we're happy to work with the administration on that. Um, we feel that uh, kids from a school should only be moved into swing space if their school is being renovated. That has historically been true. Um, Pierce hasn't been renovated since it was built about 40 years ago. And it's just pretty depressing to think about having a bunch of our kids move there and then having some of them come back with still no re renovation in sight. I know that in the Driscoll community, there's concern about um, having an expansion without a renovation um, and also having to go to, to Old Lincoln uh, during that time. So <coughs> we hope that that's a, a principle that the the, uh, the pain of relocation is balanced by the, the benefit of, um, of a renovation of the school. Um, and then maybe the most important one is we encourage you to, to take a global view of minimizing the number of extra transitions that students have to experience uh, during this plan. One of the, the key values of the K-8 model is that it, it cuts out a transition that kids have to go through. And depending on how you work this, this transition plan, there could be a lot more or many fewer transitions. Um, at Pierce, there's a concern that some kids will be sent to Old Lincoln, say for sixth grade, and then when they're done, they won't come back to Pierce because they'll be redistricted to another school. So they'll have a double transition. That doesn't feel right to us. Um, there was discussion, a mention of using uh, Pierce as a second swing space um, where kids from Pierce would be moved to Old Lincoln and then other K-5 kids would be moved into Pierce. Um, I'll run through that in more detail. That's sort of a nightmare scenario. Um, <laughs> that's on the flip side, uh, uh, transition ping pong. Um, we would encourage you to look at early redistricting um, when you know what the ultimate capacities of Devotion and Driscoll or other expanded schools will be set those district lines and start placing new families to the extent possible according to those district lines. We've heard from parents who are in buffer zones or who are in neighborhoods that could be buffer zones in the future that they were placed in Pierce and they're, they don't understand why they were if they're going to be redistricted two years from now or three years from now into another school. Um, so you can minimize the, the redistricting. Everyone is like not looking forward to the pain of redistricting. And by doing some work now, we can reduce the amount of redistricting. And then along similar lines, allow families in um, specific locations to volunteer to be redistricted early, move into a nice spiffy new devotion to save another family that maybe wants to keep siblings together from having to do that. Um, I'll just briefly run through the uh, why second swing space is a bad idea scenario. So if, if uh, using Pierce as a second swing space looks like this, you have Pierce kids in grades six, seven, and eight get moved to OLS. K-5 kids from other overcrowded schools get moved into Pierce. New buffer zone kids get placed in Pierce. 
K-5 teachers from the other schools get moved temporarily into Pierce. Then we have three years at Pierce with, where we're sort of a refugee camp where we have temporary you know, teachers, <laughs> temporary parents, temporary kids who don't have a long-term commitment to the school. Some of our kids are gone. Then at the end of the three years, you know, the kids go back to their home schools. Some of the Pierce kids yeah. come back. Some of the Pierce Can kids I get redistricted. stop you for okay. just a second? Yeah. Because, I mean, I, our practice, I won't say policy, is to keep a child, once they're in a school, in that school. Um, so that I think, I understand how, you know, you start to think ahead and want to move forward, and I'm not going to argue with you about it, but I think that right now it is maybe not the time sure. to go through this whole thing. Sure. Okay. Uh, because it, it gets complicated. I'm yeah. sure many people won't even be following what you're saying, and it's important for the administration certainly to see this. But I think that your other points are, are well taken, okay. and I think that, um, if you don't mind, I, I will good. stop you yeah. on this. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that then. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. There are more copies of this. Um, well, yes, I, I do, I do an, yes, I do. Um, so a number of these, thank you. Um, thank you. A number of these ideas came up, uh, ideas around the longer term view of the redistricting early and, and those kinds of, as, as strategies around the, um, the issue of transitions um, the other night in a forum that, uh, that we did at, at Pierce School. And, and they were terrific ideas. And, and I not only appreciate the people who raised them that evening, but I appreciate um, you bringing them up again tonight. Um, they, are, they are factored in um, to our conversations now about the longer term view of how we make all this, how we make this plan adopted by the school committee um, back in August, September of 2013, how we'll make that work? Work for both, both the families and yes. the schools. Because yes, because we do have to make space for everybody. Yes, Mr. Walton, um, Madam yes. Chair McMahon, I, I'm a, I'm a little bit um, confused actually about the focus on all of this redistricting because it has never been my understanding of our conversations so far that we were planning on a big redistricting. The scenarios that we proposed for expansion of schools would not involve major redistricting. We've been talking about use of existing buffers and running those numbers first. So I'm, right. I'm, I'm, so concerned, I'm, that I'm, hearing a, I'm so concerned that I'm hearing a big concern around future redistricting as if it's, a, as if it's a, um, absolutely going right. to happen. Right, so, so let me, let me say that the, the discussion that evening was really around, you're right, was around existing buffers between, say, Pierce and, and Driscoll schools to be renovated um, and, and the strategies that might be employed in terms of families that aren't, aren't already Pierce families and how those transitions might start earlier. So you, you're, you're right. And, and I think also the discussion that evening was if you, if you do have to redraw buffers and large buffers, those kinds of things, that you keep this kind of strategy in mind as well. That was the conversation. Okay, thank you. Because I don't think there was any discussion of town-wide redistricting, right. was, but there right. are certainly discussions of of neighborhoods. Right. That are, right. That we're not going to get out of this with no redistricting, but right. it's not big well, town-wide. Well, again, the use of redistricting is a is a it's a very important term because if we're talking about using buffer zones and largely using buffer zones that already exist because we expanded them as you'll recall mm -hmm. several years ago um, it's not the same as redistricting it's just it's just using the buffer zones and, and looking those numbers so before we talk about before we say there is absolutely going to have to be redistricting we have to look at what happens. One of the one of the major, I mean, whether or not we get the renovations and expansions that we want, whether or not we have, you know, this plan has factors. to <laughs> this plan has to go considerably farther down the road before yes. we know That's whether right. and what kind of use of buffers, expanded use of buffers, or redistricting is going to be needed. So I just That's right. But the strategies alluded to in these comments, I, it's all very good, are, right? Are, in terms of anticipating, in yeah. Our present buffers. Absolutely. I just. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, I'm going to continue here. Um, Tom Kil Kilday, am I pronouncing it correctly? Tim Kilday, maybe? It's hard to read the writing. On Og Ogden Road? No? Okay. Um, 
No? Oh, maybe. Okay. Peter Kleiner. Hi, I'm Peter Kleiner. I live at 28 Jordan Road. Um, my kids are in the Driscoll School District. And um, I guess what I'm, my feelings on this change as the plans change. So if I'm not, I've made this up just as the plans have changed uh, recently. Um, but I think that, that part of the issue is, is for me developing a decent plan. And I feel like uh, that there's a, a well used phrase that a problem well stated is a problem half solved. And I'm asking the school to, committee to um, use this current change in the plan to better define the problem and come up with a better solution. Um, as I feel that the solutions proposed aren't necessarily as good as they can be. Um, and I'm, tonight you've basically reiterated the problem. The basic problem is that, that the town has failed to provide adequate space for, for the schools, for growing uh, communities at Lawrence, Pierce, Devotion, and some of the other schools as a result of this growing community. OLS is no doubt a, a solution to that problem. It's a, it's, it exists. It has been used in the past. It provides more classroom um, net than will be provided at the end of the, the full structuring of, of, this, of the K-8 schools. Um, so I'm, I guess for me, the question is how to make it something great. Um, and I think you need to define cr the criteria a little bit better. One is to allow for maximum flexibility. Schedules change, as this committee knows well, that if you look just past six months, um, schedules have changed quite a, quite a bit in construction. Um, expect more changes. Allow for a plan that will allow for float. Two, uh, develop a more coherent master plan. Um, I think there are some things that are being studied at the high school things that are being studied at other schools. These are all pieces in the puzzle. As you've seen, they impact what this plan is. Um, three, as, as Andrew said, limit student disruption. I think there's a plan that will allow for students to enter into Old Lincoln School, not have to flip flop back and forth, um, create these school communities. And that's four, create a positive experience with, with a good school communities. Really um, make this something special and have a vision for this school. And five, um, I'm going to, to offer the possibility that you can use this as an opportunity. Um, plans change, thoughts change along the process. There is capacity at Old Lincoln School to use this through um, a limited period of time. That, lim that time frame can, can change. One of the things that has been discussed is, is uh, in regards to the solution that, that's currently on the table for the K-8 schools. And I have often heard people at, at, on the committee and, and, and the superintendent use the apologetic when talking about the beef space process. What we wanted was a, a new K-8. I think there's some information, there's some schedule float that exists that may allow for some exploration of that process in greater detail. It would just be nice to not ha always have that apologetic out there, to know that, that that was really explored to its fullest, because I don't believe that it was. Um, and so that gets to the issue of really have a vision. Have a vision not for, for Old Lincoln School, but for the whole school process. I think that the K-8 is a great model for the town, provided that it is truly a K-8 model. 1,000 student K-8s are not consistent with a K-8 model. Thank you. Thank you. Um, per Perry Stahl or Percy? I'm sorry, you, maybe you can tell me. Oh, I'll clarify, yeah. I appreciate uh, it. My name is Perry Stoll. I'm a parent of three kids at Driscoll. Um, uh, Dr. Lupini and school board, I am here, you know, this latest I'll call it flip flop uh, with OLS is a good chance to have a discussion. Um, I guess I want you to hear us, all right? Um, I imagine, imagine you're up here talking with the town the voters, the parents, the taxpayers, uh, and that you were providing vision and leadership, right? And, and I imagine that. Um, and here's, here's what I hear. It would sound like devotion. I hear you. You're already the largest school in the town, and ask you to 1,000 people is not something we want to do. There's only seven other schools in Massachusetts that big, five in Methuen, two in Brockton. We don't want to put you in that peer group. We hear you. Uh, Pierce, I hear you. Your school is beyond its capacity. 
that building with its bold experiment uh, of open floor plans and brutalist facade, it served its days, right? I'm not going to bump your, your place in the renovation queue. Your middle school kids won't face an uncertain path through the system, bouncing to and from OLS um, without even getting a renovated school. Um, we're going to be able to work with you to find an expansion place to keep your community together. Uh, Lawrence, I hear you. As some of you are telling us, there is space to add permanent non-modular classroom space there by the land swap. And Driscoll, I hear you. You don't have to shoulder the largest bulk of the expansion. Um, I hear you. It's a dense, crowded thoroughfare there in that area, and there's limited green space. Um, so I'm glad we don't have to split your community in half before and during the renovation there. Um, and then lastly, voters and taxpayers. I hear you. A new ninth school is a great solution. It's going to be equitable. It'll address, address growth um, and continue to provide for excellent neighborhood-based schools. Um, but we do need to renovate Pierce, Devotion, and Driscoll, regardless of the expansions. So we should also start thinking about Hancock's Village impact on the school system. It's a lot of money. Um, but we're going to be able to do that without sort of false crises, crises uh, due to MSBA funding. Um, that's what I imagine leadership and vision would sound like. Um, and I ask you guys to be courageous, right? As, as Peter just suggested, a new night school is not a crazy idea. It's a great idea. Or let's be honest and say, let's just use OLS, make it a middle school, and we're going to abandon K-8 as, as a model. Thank you. Um, Ken Skier. Hi, how are you? Um, I've imagined different ways that I'm going to approach this, so I'm not sure exactly how this is going to go. But if, uh, my, my take is um, sort of Would a, you just say where you live? Uh, I'm a student. Uh, I'm a, uh, I am have a student in second grade and a student in fifth grade at Pierce. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the first part is I'm here as a, as a Pierce student, my, my, my uh, uh, excuse me, a Pierce uh, parent. And um, my first uh, priority is um, making sure that uh, it's not an unsettling experience uh, for, for my children. Um, and I believe there's arguments uh, that have been made already that sort of warrant that position. Having Pierce as a swing space is admittedly a, a bad idea in and of itself and, and paired with uh, the disruptive prospect of our children temporarily relocating to OLS and returning to a, an unrenovated school makes it uh, an even worse idea in my, in my view. Um, uh, let's see, older students that would be um, relocated OLS uh, would be in what's essentially amounts to a middle school environment for that short period of time. And students and their parents moving into established Pierce community from other schools um, to be used as a, spring, uh, a swing space, again, um, there's the possibility that students will have no allegiance to or incentive to be active in the established school community that's already there. Um, the PTO groups uh, creating lasting connections with teachers and the like. Um, and I think there's a, you know, it's been proven that there's a direct correlation between classroom size and learning environment uh, and the student performance and test scores. Uh, and I'm concerned that, you know, dislocation can sort of com contribute to that. Um, this uh, scenario, unfortunately, seems to repeat itself as um, the last speaker spoke, um, you know, in different schools. There, I think everyone is you know, OLS comes up as a concern, and it's always been the go-to place. Um, as was mentioned, you know, for the last 20 years, it's been used for a number of things. And, you know, when we're talking about vision, you know, I'm just sort of a conduit as to I'm new to this game, and I don't have a history which can be good, it can be bad. I apologize if I sound uh, ignorant in, in, in any capacity, but um, as a con a conduit of hearing what people have to say so far um, has to do with sort of the vision. Uh, you know, some people, you know, because we've gone to Old Lincoln uh, consistently for the solution doesn't mean that we necessarily need to go there for a, for a best solution. Um, and I hear some people saying, you know, let's sort of step back, take a look at it, get a comprehensive plan, uh, and press the reset button. Um, <coughs> And the Brookline parent uh, um, community population is now only becoming informed uh, 
and educated about the changes that are, are being imposed. And, and um, increasingly, uh, they're finding that the limited options placed, placed before them to be sort of frustrating and untenable. Um, they're also finding the task of figuring out the bureaucracy and what surrounds these decisions is also a daunting task. So, um, you know, using OLS in the past to serve the needs, um, but I'm not sure it really, it seems like we've arrived where we're at by a bunch of sort of related but disjointed um, decisions um, and sort of easily drop back to um, going to the old Lincoln School. Um, and I think a, an a excellent example of this is um, recently what seems to be happening over at the Devotion School. Um, you know, you, you probably had two or three past plans, and now it seems like you're coming up with a plan that's allowing students to stay in place while you're renovating. And and I, 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 I'm just going to stop you on that one because I don't want people to think that that's the case. Okay. We, we are in feasibility. Feasibility is where you look at different options mm -hmm. and eventually come to a decision, which we will come to in August. Okay. But we are allowing for three options, one being new, one being uh, renovation and addition. Two being renovation. Two being, thank you. <laughs> Two being different types of renovations and additions. So. That's, that's not so, the case. Let me put it this way. To my way of thinking, with the newest possibility that came up, I think the most ideal option is the most recent one, which, which allows for um, sort of a renovation while in place, because I think it's probably best for long term for all of the Brookline community, and it's probably best for the students that are there. I think it's truly a build-in build place scenario. Mm -hmm. Um, where it's not only the buildings that are in place, but it's the students that are in place. And, and um, I, I think that um, that could be achieved at other sites, too, if the reset button is, is, is pressed and you step back and you take a look at Pierce, which we know needs a renovation. Um, I think it can be done in phases. That's, that's my vision of it. But I have a vision of it. And I'm sure there are architects that could come up with visions of it. Um, but I think it, it, it requires the will of the, the board to want to, you know, not go to the easy uh, and say, okay, you know, let's, let's use Lincoln the way we've used it. Let's look back. Um, I, I don't know. It, it's like, um, as somebody else said, there's, there's an opportunity here that um, could probably better address our future needs in a more global way, uh, maybe for less money, mm -hmm. um, you know. And I know that a lot of uh, options have been sort of, you know, there's this B space, which had a whole different set of criterion. Um, so, you know, what they're doing over at at, at uh, Devotion is there. You had a a bunch of devoted people who wanted to make a change. They came, you know. I, I, I assume to, to, to do something that would be the best thing for their school. And they came up with an objective and they created a solution around that objective. Uh, and I'm not sure, it seems more, what's going on is more ad hoc in other places. And I think if you focused your energies on these different spots and tried to say, what can we do akin to what's going on <coughs> at, at, at the devotion, what can we do at Pierce? You know, um, I think there are ways to, to build on the old building uh, while in place uh, and then build uh, completely along Harvard Ave away from the kids um, while school continues, you know. So there's like another, you know, thought. And, and I speak to people. I don't know the history of all these sites that have been considered. You know, you hear stop and shop. You hear the northeastern field. You hear, you know, there are probably a dozen of them. And what I always hear is, well, it was considered, but I don't know why it wasn't viable. And it seems like this, the B space was, from what I understand, again, I'm ignorant, was sort of rushed um, in certain regards um, and didn't really get a, a comprehensive, you know, so. And, and so the, the, I guess um, the only other thought that I have um, is that it seems as though you're going to come up with a vote 
it hasn't actually happened, maybe it's happening tonight, to say, okay, officially we're going to use the old Lincoln School. Um, and it seems like a little bit cart before the horse, like there's been a principal that's been deemed. She's already working on things, but yet the old Lincoln School hasn't yet officially been approved. And so now it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to use the old Lincoln School. And then so on down the line, you know, you have to hire faculty and staff. And of course, you now you have to fill the seats. Um, and I, uh, I don't mean to sort of, this is not to be disparaging. This is, you know, to, to, to be a way of sort of informing you of the things that I hear and sort of be a, a conduit as to that and, and sort of, I guess, put my own little twist on it that's maybe a little, it's either very retro and it can't be visited again or, you know, it's, it's very progressive and, you know, <coughs> should be done, you know. Um, so, like I said, it's easy for me to, to ramble on about it, but that's, uh, that's sort of my perspective. Thank you. Um, I think I'm going to get this last name correctly. David Belchick, is that correct? All right. Yeah. Oh, good. I wasn't sure if there was a Belichick or a Belichick. It depends. If you're a Patriots fan, maybe. I'm a Patriots fan. Uh, so I'm not. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Belchick. I live at 107 New York Terrace. I have three children, uh, all of whom go to Driscoll. One's in pre-K and the other two are in... Uh, first grade and second grade. So um, a couple things I, you know, before I start, I, I know you guys do this for a living. I don't. Um, and so I can understand. That <laughs> can I just clarify one thing? I, <laughs> we, we make this. I come in and out as, as a convenience and you've invested your time and effort and energy into doing Thank it. You. Um, Thank you. And so I can appreciate um, sometimes you're probably frustrated because people like me come in and out of the effort um, when it's convenient. Um, the one thing that I feel, again, sort of from where I sit uh, in my children in Driscoll, is that I believe there are some tactical, if I were a consultant with an advanced degree, I'd use that term, issues that we're trying to solve around old Lincoln School. Um, what I have not seen, and maybe I've missed it, but um, is sort of what the end goal is. And I don't mean the end goal of turning old Lincoln School into something for 6th, 7th, 8th grade. I guess my sort of question, and I don't know if, mm -hmm. if this is a bilateral discussion or it's supposed to be a soliloquy, I guess my question for the committee if and maybe for Dr. Lupini is, you know, what is our goal? Uh, I'll, I'll use the rhetorical device of asking a question maybe I, I think I have an answer to, which is I think the goal ultimately is to make sure that Brookline has the best schools. Um, and I'm not suggesting that this doesn't meet that goal, um, but I think in my limited experience doing this, I haven't seen something that comprehensively says this is the best thing for Brookline um, and for the school system to make it the best school uh, system that can be in the Commonwealth and perhaps the United States. And so I guess my ask of you would be, um, you know, if you had a blank sheet of paper, would this be what you'd want to do? And I understand there's practical realities of life. You have students who come in, you have to put them someplace. Uh, but in the longer term, I think you as a, as a body and we as a town will be better off if we actually had a vision that we were building towards whatever that best school system can be. Um, and so I can appreciate sometimes why that may, may be hard because the second you want to change something about someone's school, everybody's up in arms. This isn't a community that you know people kind of sit idly by and also a lot of times they have means to make life difficult. So what I would ask of you is you know, to say, how do I, in a specific time, say 10 years, because obviously we have to build schools, we have to renovate schools, it's not an easy process, to say 10 years from now, how is Brookline the best school system? Uh, I, I'm not going to say that this is right or wrong. I think you probably know better than I do. But I guess my sort of ask or what I feel has been missing throughout the process is sort of an end state goal. I understand we have to deal with specific things and practical things, and not an idealist necessarily, as my wife would probably tell you. But in some ways, I think we need to have some idealism in the process because I think that will get us to a goal, which is the best school system in Massachusetts. And I don't know that that's been a part of sort of the deliberations. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. I haven't seen it. But again, you do this more than I do. So 
you know, I don't have any specific, I don't like this, I don't like that. Um, but I think we have an opportunity, as Mr. Kleiner said, because you've got a lot of people upset already, to, um, to use that to, you know, get what we all want, which is the best school system. I think the community will respond better if they understand you're being disrupted for X period of time because of this. And I think right now, and maybe it's the fact of life, your people have been told they're being disrupted and they don't see sort of the end state, which makes them angrier than maybe if they understood this was a temporary thing. So that's sort of just my point and uh, I'll stop talking now. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank thank you. you. Um, we don't, we usually in public hearings on boards, we just listen, you know, but, but I, I do think that interaction is, is, is good. And the, all, the reason that all of us are, here and so highly compensated for this work <laughs> is that is that we're uh, we we are idealistic and we are passionate and and we, we you know we try not to be too passionate when we're listening to you because it's you know it's like we want your passion as well but but a, a, a vision has been articulated by the school committee and and it's a very simple one and and we have to operate in the real world in order to execute it and and that's hard for all of us and and hard for the families that that have the kids in the schools uh, and that vision is to renovate devotion to make an incredibly wonderful school and then to renovate in rapid succession Driscoll to make an incredibly wonderful school and then to convince the community to come up with additional money to renovate peers to be an incredibly wonderful school at which time we will have renovated all eight of our K through eights in a 25 year period and we will really have an incredible K through eight school system and that's the vision that I'm working towards and I think that we all have and that the school committee has embraced that's where we're trying to get to and and this is you know as it says this is a, a this is a transitional uh, tool to manage over capacity to get us to that to that goal that that that's the simple vision that I think I would like you to understand at least that that this body has embraced I'm sorry and the high school of course <laughs> Um, that's all the names that I have down. Are there more? Could, would you mind bringing it up? Thank you. Okay, Mike Toffel. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Toffel, a devotion uh, parent. But the comments I have today are really not devotion specific. They are. Um, in fact, related to your recommendations, and I'm going to link <laughs> my comments to your recommendations so that you can help keep track of where I'm heading. Okay, so there are three questions I'm going to ask that I would love if you feel like it, that you actually would respond to. So one is with regard to the first one of the transition elementary school of OLS. I think what's behind a lot of the anxiety in the community and my own is, will it be a suitable space? So. Mm -hmm. I understand there's a three and a half million dollar budget to renovate it. I have no understanding of whether that's sufficient. Um, I also understand, I believe, that the upgrade plans are not yet available and may not even yet have been developed, which makes me wonder, how did we get to three and a half million dollars as a reasonable figure? Maybe it's right, maybe it's woefully inadequate, and nobody in the community knows, and probably you don't know if the plan's not available, and so how do we know if it's going to be a suitable space? How can you vote on this until you can assure yourselves and us that we can avail ourselves of the right budget to make it a suitable space? So that's one question. How are we supposed to think about this three and a half million dollar budget? Is it enough? How should we, how can you give us comfort that it will be? Either that's enough or you'll do what's necessary to get enough to make it a suitable space. Outside the particulars of the renovation, still on this whether it's a suitable space, is the air quality issue, which many people have raised. Um, I study environmental issues, so I, it, there is a real, of course, a real issue of health impacts on children, especially proximate to roadways. Now, most of the studies that I've seen are mostly about highways, not you know, like interstate highways, and not so much the Route Nines of the world. But I don't know. There's been hundreds of studies. So if I understand it correctly, no air quality study has been done at Old Lincoln School to give the community comfort and yourselves that it will be a suitable space without adverse long-term adverse or short-term adverse health impacts on our children. 
this is something that could be done, be launched tomorrow if you put the, the monitoring equipment in place when you hire an engineering company and they can give you the data, which of course should be shared widely. Like, it seems to me like that's a no-brainer and yet no one's done it. It's not that expensive to commission an air quality study. So in summary, for the first one, three and a half million dollars in renovation, is that enough? Second, it, will it be a healthy place inside and outside? <coughs> Can't we get an air quality study done? The summary of these two points is like, the com I think it's beholden on all of us to give the community the comfort that it's going to be a healthful and exciting school because everyone's going to, should be invested in it. And I think that will take away a lot of my and I think others' anxiety. Like, let's give us the plan, give us the vision of that this could be a healthful and exciting place. So three and a half million dollars, air quality study. Um, let me go to the second um, recommendation, which is the, which I take specifically as being, if it's going to be an elementary school, should it be six, seven, and eight in that school? And I, I'm sure that there's a justification for this. I have had a very hard time on the website finding the justification for this. So one plea is to create a better access to all this information that's going on. Some of the comments from the speakers earlier I know are addressed in reports I have seen at some point, but I still can't go back and find them. Like the Devotion School's website is actually really good for the renovations at the Devotion School. That should be a model that the district should follow for what's going on with all of the rest of these, um, of these issues, you know, with the recommendations, the change recommendations. I get all that, but it's very hard to find one place where this is explained to see the latest information. That's just simple data management. So, with grade six to eight, what's the justification? Like, an alternative approach would be, I originally was from Somerville before here, and they have a magnificent KN1 school. It is a town-wide K1 school. In fact, they have pre-K there as well, so it's at three for some students. And the, you have an option of going to that K1 school. It's very specialized, it's all for, it's got little toilets, <laughs> little, little fields, but it's a great school. My younger, uh, my, uh, one of my children went there and it was a great school. So that avoids the disruption of anyone once they get into their maybe one or two to eight school temporarily. It avoids them having to be disrupted and then come back. So is that, has that been considered? Is it, like one thing I'm worried about is the health impacts of being so close to the roads because the little children are even more susceptible to air quality concerns. But I don't know if there's air quality concerns. Some parents are concerned, we don't have the data. So if air quality concerns, maybe that rules it out automatically, but right now that's not ruling it out because nobody knows. You mentioned, I believe, um, Superintendent, that there's cost efficiencies of putting a six, seven, eight because it's going to be used as a high school. How much are we talking about in the scheme of a hundred million dollar devotion, devotion renovation? Is this like a million dollars of savings to change out the toilets or is it a substantial number? I, I would love to get a little clarity on what the justification is for the six through eight, including costs, including the other issues. And if it's on the website, fantastic. It goes back to my plea, please help us find this information. So m many of the questions I'm asking may already have been resolved <coughs> in a very clear way on a report. And I'm just having trouble finding it. So I suspect I'm not the only one. So if you could, if you have time and you care to speak to three and a half million dollars, air quality, six to eight versus K and one. Those are my three questions. Thank you for your time. Um, so Without Mr. Rowe here. Um, uh, oh, you are. You want to speak to <laughs> You sat He's down fighting. on me, Mr. Rowe. He's um, do you want to do you want to speak to the three point five? So, of, of course, until we get the report from the architect, we don't know what three and a half million will give us exactly. What we do know is we had to fight real hard for that three and a half million dollars as we worked over the last couple of years with the advisory committee and others who, many people who thought maybe that was a lot more money than we should be putting into the building. So, uh, we were very actually proud that we were able to pull together three and a half million. We think we can do a lot. As I said earlier, um, we um, have 
located um, the Heath School, the Baker School, the Lawrence School, and the Runkle School that moved out about 14 months ago um, in that building for periods from one to two years uh, with really good experiences, I think, if you interviewed the parents and the staffs um, without putting a lot of money into the building. Uh, so we believe we'll get some significant program upgrade as well as some infrastructure upgrade. Uh, and we'll be looking in about probably four to six weeks. We'll have good information from the architect and see whether we have to make choices and, you know, understand exactly what that will buy us. Um, the, um, if you actually look at that building and then you go up the street and you look at Maimonides School and you go up the street and you look at the New Lincoln School, as the crow flies, they're all pretty close to the same distance from Route 9. So while we haven't done any testing on air quality, I think the reverse is really that there's no data to indicate there's a problem uh, with the air quality relative to using that school or, or any of the other schools or neighbors, you know. And so the question, obviously, is we could test for lots of things. And if it was appropriate, we certainly would. Uh, but there's never been any indication that there's an issue there. Um, so, you know, but that's an open question that uh, uh, if folks want to have anxiety about that and uh, we want to be, you know, use some of our um, funds to, to test for various things, we obviously can do that because but we don't believe that there's an issue that uh, we should be testing for. Otherwise, we wouldn't because we test frequently for lots of things. And, uh, Is there another question? I can do the last yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. No, go ahead. Well, the so the the question as to the the to the site. Uh, first of all, I don't. I, I actually thought every piece that we've had around these set of rec the set of recommendations was up on the website, and every piece that we've done, we've sent out to parents. Um, so, so I, I think we have done that. Whether we've grouped them in a place like we've done around some other issues like park, we can take a look at and figure out whether there's a better way for us to to place them all there. But we've talked about this issue of why these grade levels a, a number of times. Um, and some of it does have to do with, um, with cost, um, uh, particularly around the issue of, of the transition then to a high school space. And um, Mike, the issue I'd take, I'd take exception with, that you, you, you compared it to the cost of the devotion school. The actual comparison would be to the $3.5 million because it's not coming out of the devotion school. So, so that, that's the issue is, is you know, we want to try to maximize those dollars, but it's not really only one issue. It's actually a more appropriate space for older kids, we believe, than it would be for kindergartners, first graders, second graders, even on a short-term basis. Um, uh, th those were the, those were the main the main issues around the recommendation. There may have been others, but we'll make sure they get posted because it was part of the original set of recommendations. Peter, can in terms of the the budget and the planned renovations for the building, is there uh, likely to be a component uh, of upgrades to the ventilation system that would improve indoor air quality? There, there is. Um, we don't, I don't yet know exactly what that's going to be. And that, you know, is, that's obviously a big ticket item. And the question is exactly what kind of scope can they do? They probably won't replace the entire system. We need to look at the issue of fresh air and you know, where the fresh air exchanges are. And I know that when HFF, when HMFH was reporting back last summer, I think it was, or the late spring, to B Space. And this issue actually came up. Uh, I remember Pip Lewis speaking to how, if they were approaching that, you know, you know the use of Old Lincoln School, because they were talking about using it as a ninth building at that point, you know, how they felt that this was not a, an issue that would prevent it from being developed because of the actions you could take. I don't know whether, you know, we'll be able to make that kind of a significant modification of the building. Uh, so, you know, it's just an open question at this point. So, but as I say, it's also I don't know what level of issue it is. Let me do one other piece on the budget, which, which is that, um, you know, even, even throughout the days this week, Mr. Rowe and I have been involved in conversations with the town administrator, the deputy town administrator, about the cost of a, of a Lawrence school um, stick construction versus what was put into the budget originally for modulars. Uh, around somebody mentioned Sperber Center and the develop we, we've talked about some of those options. We've talked about this option and whether and what happens if what we tr truly believe we need to do exceeds 3.5 and and involves choices that we just can't make. And and all of that will involve choices. It will involve trade-offs within the CIP. 
um, and, and, and those kinds of issues for us to address as we, as we get those cost estimates and we make choices around what we, what we need to do. So those conversations are taking place even as, uh, even as we're waiting for the cost estimates to come back to see whether we can do what we believe needs to be done within the $3.5 million. Yes, sorry. I don't. I don't want to belabor this, but I do. I. I do just want to um, empathize with your um, sense of frustration at not being able to find one coherent place to find something. I know every time I go to try to provide a link to a study that's on embedded in either our website or in the town website, um, it's almost impossible just to copy the address of the link um, to provide it to people. So, um, totally hear you. A, a lot of what happens. Um, a, a lot of what happens in terms of our discussions and decisions doesn't exist in a report. There, we, don't, we don't do comprehensive reports on everything. So what happens is that some of the discussions that you were looking for, such as the, you know, why six through eight, I mean, that goes, we had long conversations at B-Space about old Lincoln School and its, um, and its suitability for younger students versus older students and all of those things. So some of this is in minutes, some of it's in captured in final reports, some of it's in subcommittees, and, and they are. They're all over the place. And um, so, again, sympathize with, you know, why isn't it all in one place? It isn't. Um, but, um, but if you've got a specific question about some things, maybe you can also get in touch with a member of the committee and just ask. And but we will, we can we will take a look at right, putting no, no, all no. the documents around this set of discussion, this set of issues in one place. Right. We'll, we'll be able to do that. That's true. And just on the, on the air quality, um, again, this came up when we were um, talking about Old Lincoln School and B-Space. I understand that there are sort of ongoing concerns. I am happy to offer myself as a member of the subcommittee to talk to the Department of Public Health um, and just ask them whether or not there is something um, straightforward that they could do uh, around air quality just to just to see and I mean it may be that it's too expensive that it's too big a study but I would be happy to talk to the Department of Public Health and and see whether they have any capacity to do something like that just well, to I, set I think we should do that in conjunction with the architects that we have who you know I, I agree and, I mean and I, with, the art, with and the, the building department and so. HMFH did did speak to that um, right. and spec, you know spoke to it but again if it's it's just, I'm, I'm just happy to ask the question of the Department of Public, Public Health. It seems to me it's a simple question to ask. Thank you. Uh, Kate Silva. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Kate Silva, and I have uh, a sixth grader, a ninth grader, and a twelfth grader. Um, and so the first thing I want to say is my twelfth grader went to OLS in first and second grade and um, during a Lawrence renovation for two years, and I actually have no issue with the building. I have a sixth grader who's at risk of going over there, and I just, you know, for whatever that's worth to people. I, the building, we were nervous about the building, but it has its charms, and it's, you know, it was fine, I actually thought. Has a nice auditorium. <laughs> what? Has a nice auditorium. Yeah, and so, and, you know, and I think you guys have hired excellent leadership, and, you know, I think, so I, that, that doesn't worry me too much. I have um, two questions and just sort of one comment. One, the comment is that, um, you know, and, and admittedly, I have a sixth grader, which focuses your mind a little bit. So I do know that my sixth grader would be at risk of going there in eighth grade. Um, and this summer, B Space considered an eighth grade school townwide. And I know that there were a number of reasons for rejecting that, including staffing issues. And mm -hmm. but I mean, one of the issues is a transition in and a transition out to a different school. Mm -hmm. And I and I actually, personally, that is my main concern. I would I wouldn't mind if he were going to start there next year and go there for two years. But I. You know, I mean, just thinking about my own child, I feel like that is going to be a rough year to transition to a big new middle school and he's not used to middle school and then be thinking about that high school transition. And I kind of feel that way for any eighth grader. So I kind of feel that way for the Driscoll sixth graders and the Pierce sixth graders. And I just hope that as you guys kind of think through the puzzle of, you know, you don't want someone to go over there for three years. I understand that. And I mean, but just to be thinking about what it will be for those eighth graders who go over there and as soon as they get there start thinking about transitioning to a new school and, <laughs> and we're new to middle school and it'll be the first year that that school is constituted as a middle school. So I just think that's a, that will be tricky for that particular cohort. So I just want, I mean, I, I know, I'm sure you're aware of it, but I just want it, you know, hope it stays in the mix. Then the two questions which are not particularly visionary, I'm just really cu just curious and I, I haven't heard them spoken to. So. There's a building plan that's in Coet at Lawrence and similarly at Driscoll, right? So they're 
in the air, but they're not, we don't have them buttoned down yet. And I would assume that they, if they were buttoned down, say, this spring, then they'd have, you know, they would have some path importance to this question the same way Devo did, right? Yeah. The same way, so, okay, so, um, so I'm wondering sort of, as you're thinking about these schools, how does the timeline of getting that Driscoll plan formalized and the timeline of getting the Lawrence plan formalized help us figure out who's gonna go over there? Because it looks to me like you're gonna have to make that decision before those two plans are formalized. So that just, I'm just kind of curious how those play. And then the final specific question, because I, I don't understand Driscoll as well, um, but I'm sure their issues are actually bigger. But just at Lawrence, um, so if, if we do in 2016 open up four new classrooms at Lawrence, which is you know, one thing that's obviously on the table, and then Lawrence kids are over at the old Lincoln, are you gonna populate those classrooms? You, you know, because now you've got capacity, so I would presume you'd wanna populate those classrooms and you're gonna populate them with buffer kindergartners and do those buffer kindergartners become Lawrence's problem for nine years? Are they, I mean, not problem, but are they part of the... <laughs> in terms they, of numbers of sections, yeah, problem. Yeah, in terms of yeah. numbers of sections, right. So do, is there like a BOA constrictor going through Lawrence all those mm. years because of the two years that the Lawrence kids were over at Old Lincoln? And um, so I just, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm just curious. That's my, that's the Lawrence construction yeah. specific question, and I'm sure there are, uh, there's an identical issue around Driscoll. I just don't know what it is. So. Yeah, what I, a, do you mind? There's yeah, please. What, what I said at the, um, uh, I think our last meeting is Lawrence is actually the simplest of these conversations to have about the other options because it's really dependent on those four classrooms and what we find out about the timeline and and those kinds of things and whether we can secure the additional funding to make that happen and those kinds of things and and if we found a way to do it in this time frame my sense is, is it takes Lawrence off the off the table Even because, yeah sure because you don't move the kids and then create what you just said you don't move them to move them for one year and then move them back and you don't move them and then say hey we got a great place for more kindergartens let's put six kindergartens at Lawrence and then you've created that problem for nine years right so you don't do that so if if you come up with a solution that solves the Lawrence problem in that time frame then you find other one-year pieces that get you through with the Lawrence piece of the solution um, I'm I'm gonna go on to the next person who hasn't had a uh, you're finished right Kate okay thank you um, to the next person who hasn't had a chance, unless it's a, a very short question, um, I think. Marion Nobrega? I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your name Don't worry, correctly. I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> My name's Mariah Nobrega. I'm oh, a Mariah. Pierce parent um, from Bowker Street, and I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 4. I have a third grader and a kindergartner at Pierce. Um, and I'm also a graduate of Lawrence, class of 1994, and BHS, class hey. of 1998. <laughs> so I've gone through the, uh, the renovation rodeo at the high school um, with Dr. Smith Mumford. Oh. My brother was at the uh, freshman campus, and I was at the high school. Um, so I guess I have a couple quick points. I, I'm so impressed by so much great thought and articulate comments from the audience tonight. I, it makes me feel great to be a Brookline resident to hear all this great stuff. I just wanted to add a couple of other points um, and things that I want to reinforce. Because <coughs> I was really involved in the, in the No on OLS campaign for um, over the summer and t tortured you all probably through the B space process. Um, but I, I guess we went through that B space space process with the understanding that there was this pressing timeline at the end of the summer and we made a lot of decisions or decisions were made. Um, based on this concern for time and it doesn't seem like that timeline is held up and so I wonder if we really can go backwards and say to ourselves not that we're blaming what happened uh, B space on any one person but that those were decisions made in the heat of thinking there was a deadline and can we go back and one of them I really want to reconsider which I heard so many people talking about tonight or several people at least was the ninth K through eight and whether there is any opportunity because as we heard from again some people out here we're looking for something that Brookline can get behind. And these stopgap measures, they really don't get us to this vision that we can really drive the whole town to support. And a ninth K through eight in a new building is really something that people want to invest in as opposed to you know, cobbling together $3 million here or this or that. Um, so I think the ninth K through eight has the benefit of not only 
in my mind, separating out this concept of renovation and expansion because people look at this devotion price tag and they start grousing about $110 million for five classrooms when I would imagine that the bulk of that is actually going towards just a renovation project and not an expansion. Um, and so I think that there's something to be said again just for taking that moment to go back, look at whether or not we can do anything with ninth K through eight. Um, it really, the, the idea that eminent domain was completely discarded um, really just was frustrating to me at that time. Um, uh, OLS, as a Pierce parent, I'm really concerned about sending my kids there. Before we lived on Bowker Street, for the first two years we were at um, Pierce, we lived on Juniper, so we crossed <laughs> over Route 9 many times a day, several times a day. Um, and I don't know if any of you crossed over there, but if you haven't, then you should go and see how many cars run red lights or advance through the red lights. I think it's great that so many kids have been able to go to Old Lincoln without there being a horrible accident, but it really, really concerns me. I really appreciate the comments on health that were made because these are the two primary issues I feel like uh, are, are really an issue for Old Lincoln. As far as the cost over the summer, we quoted out the cost for doing air quality studies. It's less than $1,000. There's really no reason that you can't do the air quality monitoring studies um, along with some of the traffic studies that I think the traffic studies were about $500. Um, so while it was hard for the parents to pull together out of their own pockets, um, it might be something that could be relatively simply done through the larger budget. Um, and then I think that that would either, that would definitely inform you even if it doesn't um, con relieve parents' concerns, it would finally uh, resolve the discussion about health and safety. So those are my comments and thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard Strauch, or Strauch? Strauch. Strauch, sorry. Not, not doing so well on pronunciation. But then again, people can't pronounce my name either. So. You know, I was worried I might have to do that. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> so Richard Strauch, I live at uh, 51 John Street. Um, uh, I am a parent of a kindergartner at Devotion. So in full disclosure, there's a good chance this won't directly impact me. But I think there's enough in flux here that we don't really know for sure. And I'm just trying to be, as a new, newer parent to the system, I'm trying to get involved and be a part of the process so that I'm prepared for some of the, the more relevant decisions. Um, some of the folks up here have commented on some of the things I wanted to comment on. First off, I want to thank you all for the work you've done. I, I mean, I think when I get a message from Dr. Lupini, I can't even imagine what your inbox is like or how you get anything <laughs> done during the day. Uh, and especially with the transparency of the process, making that, I'm sure, much worse you know, for everybody. Um, one of the comments I really had come up here to make was a question about air quality. And um, I, I guess, you know, it has been addressed a little bit. One thing I'd like to add that I think has gone much unnoticed is if I remember back in October, I think it should be said that the World Health Organization um, finally classified air pollution as a carcinogen, formally. So I think there are all sorts of layers of the onion we could peel back on this. We can do an air, and somebody else mentioned, I'm, I'm always a little bit um, hazy on where the other schools are located, but I don't think anything is as close to Route 9 as OLS, is it? Of our public schools? Yeah. No. Well, if our, you look at Lincoln, schools. there's one house in between. Yeah, of okay. our public schools, no. Okay, and, right. and, and in fairness, and because I've struggled this with home yeah. purchases as well, I don't know what a relevant distance is. It may be that there's no appreciable difference between being a mile and a half away and right on the road, or it may be that there is. And then there's a whole secondary level of, you know, whatever, whatever the public thinking is, it, you know, the science is evolving. And so that does, that does concern me. I mean, we are moving in a direction where we have a greater sense that air pollution is a carcinogen. And for younger kids, the organisms are more sensitive. And so I'm not quite sure what level we need to assess this on, but if kids are going out and then they're being active in an outdoor space, where there's a greater air intake than when you're just at rest. Um, I don't know what the implications are here, but I think, it's, I think it should be on folks' radar screens. Um, uh, so that is, I guess, the one, the one real nuts and bolts comment um, I had wanted to make and, and was partly addressed, but I'll just amplify that. Um, one procedural question I had that's been a little unclear to me is, as this has been going on, I've, I've seen a lot of variable scenarios, but my understanding is that the, the OLS would be hopefully ready for use in 2015, is that yes. correct? Mm -hmm. but, but then the timelines I've seen for Devotion, we're not bringing a class until 2016? That's correct, but we don't make it to 2016 at Devotion in terms of having room for the K 
K through 8s that are there. If our projections are correct, and we believe they are, yeah. if anything, they've been exceeded by reality over the last number of years, okay. then, um, then we'll actually exhaust all of our space at Devotion um, next year. We, we think we'll make it next year, right? Um, and, and we would have to, that's why we need it in 2015. It, the 2015 timeline, even in the original set of recommendations, was not about the, the uh, construction project. It was about simply about running out of space. About the space. Oh, about yes. Okay. Um, so I think that's really it. I mean, I, I in, in contrast to some other folks, and I think other folks have probably some more pressing concerns with the way their schools are going to change and maybe some of the issues. Um, you know, at Devotion, the biggest question, I think, is how big will it be? And mm -hmm. we've gotten some surveys that have given a couple different models. And I guess, you know, the only thing I would add that, that um, on the positive side, that if it helps folks is, number one, I think we have to remember that it's adults who are the most inflexible. That <laughs> kids, you know, kids, um, we worry about this. We wring our hands. And as a parent, I'm reminded every day, uh, you know, oh, daddy, don't worry about it. You know, my, my child constantly reassures me. Uh, and I think that... Um, People don't like change. Organisms are programmed to not like change, right? It's not good if your world changes around you. Uh, but usually it's the change that's difficult, and once we get there. So I, I have a lot of confidence in the process, and I know there's been a lot of thought and uh, consideration and a lot of hand-wringing about the best way to go about this, and there's probably no right or wrong answer. Um, and, you know, even, even with the quick transitions, I'll remind, this may be a little young or maybe kids in more, um, in more private school settings experience this, but kids go away for a year abroad. They move in and out um, with great facility, uh, you know, into different environments. And I think, I don't remember whether it was you or somebody else who said, there can be a lot of nuggets buried. And I think it's all conjecture until we get there. Um, so I, I don't feel too worried about, uh, you know, as long as my kids are safe, I think, you know, with a renovated place, I have a lot of concerns. There's going to be dust. There's going to be air quality issues. There's going to be disruption. Um, the kids probably won't notice that. But I think so long as their health is provided for, safety crossing the road, good indoor air quality, um, this may be a little bit of growing pain, and I think that even, I mean, somebody correct me, but even if we go through a ninth, for a, a, a ninth you know, school, there's still the question that these other schools are behind the curve and need to be renovated. And I think it's very easy to lose focus amidst all the anxiety that at the end, what, what we're saying is you're getting a shiny new present, and there's going to be a little pain to get there. But, uh, you know, I, 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 in contrast to some of the other folks, and again, I think some people have some much more serious considerations about, you know, I, I couldn't quote them all, but I know some of the other schools, it's not such a sweet deal, uh, or there's some real concerns about, you know, redistricting, or how big is our school going to be, or what's being, being done. But I, in an overarching sense, I, I, feel, uh, I feel pretty confident about it. I think it's pretty, uh, I mean, it boggles my mind, the scope of it, and how you guys are going to do it, and all the different <laughs> levels of complexity. But, um, but that was really it. But I would like to see careful attention paid to the environmental issues and, and, and so forth. That's my biggest concern, I think, and that's, that's about it. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I uh, just to, to also reassure people here that when we, for instance, did the high school and renovated it, we did it in a phased manner where we did, um, um, not survey, but um, um, the air quality was monitored, monitored throughout. And Heath as well as we did it. So, so safety is certainly a concern that we always look at for children. Also, with crossing the street and having monitor uh, policemen, uh, crossing guards or policemen uh, crossing. That that's also been our our practice at, at these schools. So, but thank you for your comments. Um, that was the last person I have signed up. Sure. <laughs> well, we can clap. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate it. Hi, I'm uh, Julie Bruno. I'm a Pierce parent. I live on Davis. I have a seventh grader and a third grader. And I wanted to speak to um, the uh, use of two different uh, schools at the old Lincoln School. I do believe that you can probably work out safety issues and air quality issues. And I know there are a lot of positives to your plan. It solves a lot of your problems and does a lot of great things. But it's got this huge inequity that you're exposing these several years, a, a small group of Brookline students to a middle school when everybody else gets to go to K-8. to eight. And having just my son did sixth grade last year, he started going to different rooms. He had different teachers. He had more homework. He had different homework. 
that was due a few days later, and he had to figure out how to handle that stress. And before that, for him, it had been smooth sailing. And wow, that was a different year for him. And to add to that, combining with another school, at the same time that they're going, entering adolescence and going to dances, I mean, we've, in many ways, life is different in sixth grade. They start going to dances, we get help from the principal about how to deal with the stress and everything. I mean, it's a bad time. And I can easily picture my daughter, who's in third grade, who would be at Old Lincoln for sixth grade, I believe, her sixth grade at Pierce versus her sixth grade at Old Lincoln. And I can envision, you know, her being focused and dealing with this big change that's going on at school and all this homework, or at Old Lincoln where there's this whole other school and all these boys and all these girls and everybody's getting to know each other and and I really believe her grades would suffer. And we can talk about all the different problems, but if a kid's grade is gonna suffer, and I, I believe it would because of combining, um, having a middle school, which you have all soundly rejected as not good, no matter if you hire the best principal in the world, you've chosen K to eight. And so I am speaking for my daughter I don't think a middle school would be good for her, whether it's Pierce or any any middle school. So that's thank you. Does anybody else? Yes, please, and please state your name and your address would be great. Sure. Uh, my name is Greg Rogers, and I live at 37 Winchester Street in the Devotion District, and I have a fifth grader at Devotion. Um, I have just one request. If I'm reading this week's letter correctly, it states that um, the process, as we've talked about already today, the process for transforming Old Lincoln is en route. It's happening. It's already been started. Um, people have been hired and ideas are being bandied about and budgets are being bandied about, et cetera. But according to the letter, it implies that it will be after the summer when the principal will start to engage with communities. Once this decision has been made, then we'll start engaging with parents, teachers, and other people about all that. And since that's six months away, it seems like a lot's going to get done between now and then. And the request would be, I would hope that there's a plan to um, engage community members far before that so we can understand what's going on and have some input because obviously a lot will get done in the next six months. Thanks. You want to speak to that? Um, in terms of general kinds of information to schools that may be impacted, absolutely. What, what, what the letter really means is that it, it, is, it is some time that could be as late as September 24th when we'll have the specifics. I mean, we had talked at one of the forums I did at Devotion about a parent advisory group and, th and those kinds of pieces. Um, those things, yeah, those things may be more difficult to put into place until we actually know who's going to the school. Although I will tell you, I've had some parents from some schools say, if our school's not going, I'd still like to be on the advisory group for this, which I really appreciate. So, um, so yes, in terms of those, those pieces that are going on and sharing with the community, absolutely over the next X number of months, more specific work with the people um, whose children will actually attend there beginning as soon as we can make the recommendation, which, will, which could only be as late as September 24th. George, do you want to come to that? Please state your name and your address. Uh, my name is George Abbott White. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I had two, uh, two daughters uh, go through the Brookline schools. I taught 42 years in, New in Newton, uh, what was called junior high and then high school. And uh, we've lived in Brookline, my wife and I, 40 years. And I'm, I'm delighted to hear uh, all the people who are parents uh, I'm a parent too, and I guess what I want to say is that uh, my oldest daughter just got married, <laughs> but what I want to say is that one of the conversations that came up around marriage is that uh, a person who said, well, you know, in some, in some uh, religions or in some under understandings, people are married for the moment or they're married for eternity, and I remember that a professor once said that to me. I'm not teaching you for the moment, I'm teaching you for all time. So I guess what I'm saying is that uh, I represent a certain group in this community. 
this, I'm not indifferent <coughs> to the schools and the kids who are going to them. And uh, a number of my neighbors are not indifferent either. Uh, it really matters to us. My oldest daughter thinks she's going to move back here and raise a family because the schools are so good and because she had such terrific experiences here. So I guess what I want to say is that in terms of these issues around you know, building buildings and uh, making sure that they're healthy and having, having good teachers and, and having people who are willing to come out until these hours at night either to raise questions or to try to deal with them. Uh, this is part of what our community is about. So it's not just people without children, and it's not just people with children. It's people who had children, and in a way, still have them. And in terms of what you want to do as parents for your kids now, I'm here because I support that. I'm here because I want that to happen and to keep happening. And I think that one of the things, if I may say, that you need to do is there are lots of people in not just the Devo community, but in Pierce and in Lawrence and in Baker. And you folks need to, I think, uh, speak to them and get them on board uh, and, and get them to see uh, that what they have to say and what their experiences were are, will be helpful to you and to your children uh, because it really matters. I mean, I'm still a teacher. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I actually have a pragmatic Wait. question, but I just No, no, you can't do anything right. until you tell me your name and your My address. name is Sarah Stoutland. I have three. Say it. I'm sorry. Sarah Stoutland. I have a fourth grader and an eighth grader at Driscoll and a tenth grader and the um, BHS. And George's daughter babysat for my 15-year-old when my 15-year-old was three months old <laughs> okay. and did continue until she finally never came back to Brookline again when she was off busy doing other things. I just want you to know that the fact that I had Gwen there, I knew that, dr that BHS produced non-stressed, wonderful kids, and it really kept me going through those early years. <laughs> I have a really pragmatic question, though. Can you go through the scenario like you did with Lawrence for Driscoll? Like, I still can't get through my head, how is Driscoll taking out seven or eight or six, seven, eight in Driscoll? And what are you going to do? Because we're not overcrowded. We're overcrowded, but we're not over capacity in classrooms right now. What's, what would be a couple scenarios that you could say for Driscoll where you move them out? What do you do with those? Are you doing it during construction? Are you, do, you know, can you just kind of, what are your current ideas? Right, I'll be, I'll be the first All right. um, so. So the Driscoll is much more dependent on the, um, on the construction project and is based on an assumption that we used very early on in this process because we've been actually talking about this temporary process for a few years now, um, uh, that, um, that we don't have swing space for the entire school in the way that we did Runkle and other projects, but that we could not do the Driscoll, could not do any Driscoll project with all of the students in the building and therefore we'd have to make accommodations like devotion. So as, as, um, as we do statement of interest, as we proceed on with that process um, and test that out a little bit further, not much by, by the time frames that we're working with, um, that as a possible scenario will come more into focus for us. Um, I've said given, given the plan that the school committee adopted in, in, Janu in um, uh, September of 13, it, it is certainly a very likely scenario that that, that particular scenario works and matches up well with the devotion scenario because we're talking about a similar time frame. We're talking about the need for some, some group of our students to not be in the building during a project for us to have flexibility in terms of moving students around, all of those kinds of things. It will be, however, much less, much less better tested than, than what we're working with at devotion where we actually are starting to look at configurations and what um, uh, and, and what moves might, might look like during a construction project. We won't have that level of, of, of sophistication of plans, of any plans, uh, for Driscoll by that point. Yeah, it's it, yeah. Um, I mean, I can just speak to what the the preliminary discussions have been at Devotion, and what I've done in other buildings and districts is is by having a certain number of the students 
not in that building, you create flexibility to create moves and you move and you renovate and you move and you renovate. You build new, you move into the new, you renovate. That, that's how. No, it's, it's called what? Well, yeah, it's, 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 it's when, you don't have, when you don't have swing space for a period of time for, for certain buildings, um, you, you do those kinds of moves and you make accommodations. And you try to take those things into account to make sure that you don't have, you know, kids going upstairs who, who you don't want having to go up sets of stairs and those kinds of things. Yeah, it's been done. A um, number of districts have done. You know, I said early on in this process, um, and, and I understand comments about OLS, okay? I've been here 10 years, so I understand comments about OLS. I also understand that, that there are districts that would love to have the swing space that we have, right, and don't have it. And they're the districts that call us every month and ask us if they can rent the space to bus their kids from places like Needham and other school districts and have the OLS for swing space, which is what we're talking about here, swing space, right? So, so sw we're, we're very fortunate to have, to have swing space that we can actually utilize and not have to build entire buildings with kids in them, which uh, some districts need to do. Dave, uh, Mr. Powell? I just wanted to clarify that in terms of a phased school renovation, it, it's in increments of school years and summers, school years and summers. And you don't move people around month right. to month or whatever. Right. But what happens is in the summer, you try to make hay and get, you know, raise the dust and, and, and get all of the more challenging environmental work done when the kids aren't there. And then you, you, you batten it way down. You, you know, you create divisions within the buildings and then you create a sheltered space and you give it back to the principal and you stay out of it and let them run the school in that part and there may be still ongoing construction during the school year on another part of the site and then you go back to work in the summer. Okay. Thank you, David. Um, I think Barbara Scott, Scotto? Uh, I, I just want to take a minute to say, first of all, I've, I've heard some really thoughtful people speak tonight, many interesting suggestions, uh, certainly things for us to take into consideration. But I also want to talk for a minute about the constraints that we work under, because I know lots of you know them, but a lot of you are kind of new to this process. You've heard something is going on in your school, so you come out and you get involved. But first of all, when you're talking about building schools, you are working with the MSBA. Now that um, deadline last summer had to do with reports that had to be to the MSBA around the devotion school, but that governed a lot of what B-Space was talking about. It was a very tight schedule. You get, when you work with the, the MSBA, you march to their drummer. You don't march to yours. They have certain schedules that you must adhere to. And even if um, you decide that you will pay as a town yourself for something, there are certain legal requirements around the phases of the building. And there have been lots of people asking us for, for answers to questions about where their children are going to be or how long this is going to, all kinds of things that we have no answers to and we can't hurry up and get them because we are not in that phase of the building process. We are limited by these kinds of constraints. The constraints that I'm talking about are those of process. And I also want to talk about other constraints, one of which is money. We don't have a lot of it. We have to negotiate with the town. We might have to get overrides. We do have some in the CIP, the Capital Improvements Program. But money is always tight. And I keep hearing people refer back to taking things by eminent domain. And I want to just point out a couple of things. First of all, yes, you can take things by eminent domain. But you pay market rate. Now, I'm going to take um, the TJ Maxx building is an example. That has an assessment of $8 million. If you take it by eminent domain, it's not the assessed price you pay, it's the market value. Now, if you have pro a, a lot and a building that's assessed for $8 million, that's a thriving business, 
think of what they are going to ask you to pay for it. So if we decided we wanted that, number one, the town would have to find the money to pay for it. The second thing is that $8 million brings us um, tax money every year, tax revenue. So if we took that property, not only would we have to pay for it, our tax base, our commercial tax base goes down. Now, the people who own TJ Maxx may not be too happy about your taking their property. So they go to court. But that doesn't matter because you can build anyway. So you build your school and you have this gorgeous new school built there. And then the court says something was done wrong and they award, they, they, they hold up TJ Maxx's claim. TJ Maxx can take that property again <coughs> with your school on it. So you can lose everything in eminent domain. You don't do eminent domain lightly or easily because of the financial costs that are the costs that you are paying, the financial costs that you're losing in your tax base, and your legal costs, and that potential at the end that you're going to lose something. So when we don't think about eminent domain, it's largely because it's really, it, you really have to, to think carefully about whether you can afford eminent do domain and you can afford that risk. The other thing that I want to say is that because, now I'm leaving eminent domain now and going back to the process, because of the process, things change all the time. So we think we have answers at one time, and then we turn around and something in the process has changed, and we're back at square one. And finally, the thing that I want to say is, in terms of time, we have a staff and administration and the principals that is basically no larger than we had when we had 30 some percent less children. And we're not dealing with all of these issues. So there are demands being made on our staff and administration, the principals as well, that are almost impossible for them to keep up with because they have to decide what they are giving up. And if they're giving up something, it's something in the educational realm that has to be given up to take up this slack. So I do want you to think about the fact that we are doing our best. Our staff is doing its best. You have wonderful ideas, but sometimes we can't meet those. We can't do the kinds of things you suggest because we're already in that process. We know, we know the costs of things that you may not see, which we're happy to tell you about if you want to ask us about it. But I just, I appreciate all your thoughtfulness and I hope we can do some of the things you might have suggested, but we do have these constraints that we're working under. So there it is. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Barbara, um, yeah, I want to thank you because your point about eminent domain and policy got me thinking about something. Um, when I think about the school overcrowded problem, it's because everybody wants to move here. And one of the things that I've noticed in my little neighborhood of Brookline that it seems like lately, and we've lived in our house for about two-ish years, is that there seem to be a number of houses that get sold. They're single-family houses, and let's say for sake of discussion, make math easy because I'm not a math guy that the typical family has two kids in Brookline. So that means you have a single family house, they have two kids, maybe they're gone. Well, what ends up happening, at least where I live, is those get converted into condos, which means you have two families who have four kids, so that's two more kids than you had before. Um, I guess my question, if we're trying to solve overcrowding, is can we use zoning to prevent those sorts of things? Maybe you've thought about it and it's not possible, you're worried the developers will sue you, but it, it, it seems to me that there are maybe some policy things we can do to tamp down on one of our problems. So it got me thinking, and I yeah, apologize. No, it, it, this it, actually, great minds think alike, because I know there are many people here who have been thinking about that, too, and have been affected by, by that issue, and it's something that the town needs to, to talk about in terms of zoning. I don't know yeah. if 
Zoning is not zoning is not something that's handled by the school committee. Understood. <laughs> so I mean, but, uh, it's one of the few. Fortunately, things um, <laughs> but there have been um, there have been many different neighborhood uh, associations which have. I mean, people use all sorts of ways to do what you're suggesting. Um, historic uh, preservation and neighborhood conservation districts are one way. Changing zoning. Um, Many years ago, when this problem started, I actually I, um, had a conversation with the planning department about um, the possibilities of imposing a cap on development um, because of what we were seeing and exactly what you described. And the answer is that um, cities and towns can cap development, but only um, for impact on infrastructure such as water and sewer. Um, you cannot do it for impact on other services, um, in particular schools. And so, um, in terms of a broad, uh, a blanket um, restriction um, to to get at the, the expansions that you're describing, no, we can't. Um, but individual neighborhoods certainly have options. Just two two points. One is um, we haven't talked at all about Hancock Village tonight. Um, but Hancock Village is another large um, d development that has the potential to bring hundreds of children into the South Brookline area. So that's that's on the table. It's been a long-standing discussion in South Brookline and at the school committee level. Hasn't come up tonight, but that is another place. Um, I will say that there are d two comments. One is the override study committee process, which is a parallel process to this one, has a subcommittee dedicated to demographics. And um, not only they have, they have been struggling mightily with exactly the question that you're raising, um, and there are many financially minded and, and numerically minded people on that committee, um, and they've had lots of expert help from um, external consultants and from um, residents who've done demographic work. Um, the other thing, but it's a very, very hard question, because if you, if you take, for example, something that's happening at the Driscoll School, as you well know, there are families that are uh, a family of four in a one bedroom. Right, and so it, the reason that they're doing that is because of the quality of the school. So they are putting two children in the bedroom, they're partitioning the, the living room, and the parents are sleeping in a partitioned living room. And um, so if, if, if forget about taking a single family, maybe with empty nesters, turning it into two condos, each of which has two to three children, and you've gone from zero to six overnight, you also have people accepting less housing than one might traditionally expect, or this community has traditionally um, experienced. Um, because of that, so at any rate, if you start if you start doing that math, then the then the upside potential is truly um, uh, horrifying, outstanding, outrageous. I mean, it's it's unlimited, right? So so I think what the demographic subcommittee is attempting to do is test many of these hypotheses. They have data on the conversions that, that we were talking about. They have. Um, I mean, there's a whole Hancock Village process about what are the impacts um, of that on South Brookline. Um, there's actually a group of MIT students from Sloan who have offered their services on a volunteer basis. They're going to get credit for it, um, class credit for it, um, to the Override Study Committee. And um, by mutual um, decision, they are dedicated to the demographics question about what are the long-term um, changes and progression. So anyway, it's a, it is a big, big question that lots of people are trying to look at from different camera angles. I just want to clear up one other thing on eminent domain because there might be a little bit of question about it. Um, the the only way that they can get the, the property back through eminent domain is by showing it wasn't for a public purpose. Um, and if there was actually a school on it, I think that would be hard to make. But <laughs> but um, but but the, but but, but, the but, 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 the, but the price is actually what's what's a, w deeply complicated. And whether or not you would have elected officials who would it's not technically building at risk because that means something specific, but building in a risky situation where you actually don't know the price tag because litigation can take many many more years. So so for the most part, it's a financial decision. Just just so there's clarity. Yeah. Okay, but that's the clarification I just made, which is that, that that unless it's for unless you can demonstrate that it was not for a public purpose, which a school would be, you are it's the it's the valuation. Okay, I think we've everybody has had a chance to speak that that's been here, and I want to thank all of you for coming and sharing your thoughts and ideas. Um, we appreciate it. <laughs> we really do. We will take them into account and um, stay tuned. Uh, the Capital Subcommittee will be meeting on Tuesday morning at uh, 8.30. Um, the agenda is posted on the town website. And thank you. The Devotion School Building Committee is meeting tomorrow.